My aim today is to introduce you to Ivan Capitan and Peter Rudolph's 2001 slapstick comedy, Ube Tigrish, or Glass Tiger. Set in an unspecified area of present-day Hungary, Glass Tiger centers on the uneventful life of cafe proprietor Lolly, an American fanatic paid by Rudolph, and his loyal band of hapless clientele. Through a series of tenuously linked vignettes, we witness the various haphazard happenings that occur in and around the Glass Tiger Cafe, an American-themed fast food restaurant situated seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Glass Tiger was the debut feature production of Film Partners, produced on a humble budget of 150 million florins, which is approximately 600,000 euros. Despite these modest resources, Glass Tiger went on to become one of the most successful Hungarian films of 2001, and introduced audiences to one of the most popular film franchises in the history of Hungarian cinema, with successful sequels released in 2006 and 2010. Over the course of my address, I will demonstrate how Glass Tiger articulates a critique of increasing neoliberal trends in Hungary. Throughout the film, we have given evidence of the Americanization of popular culture in the form of scattered and repeated references within the mise-en-scene, dialogue and characterization. However, through Lolly's quest to own a Chevrolet parlor, the film allegorically suggests that despite the ubiquitous presence of Western consumer items, the social mobility that many thought would accompany the market economy has been denied. I will then go on to examine Glass Tiger's suggestion that the American consumer culture masks the legacy of communism with the trinkets of consumption. I maintain that behind the facade of westernization, one is able to observe the extent, uh, of which, uh, the extent to which the uh, social, socialist footprint remains evident. This analysis forms part of a larger study uh, that will address post-communist Hungarian cinema's maintained connections to indigenous society in an increasingly global and transnational milieu. Brian Burns states, the ethos of Hungarian cinema, unlike that of Hollywood, is resistant to transplantation or interbreeding. Its great virtue is its close relationship with a particular local culture and its servicing of the needs of that culture. My research, which center, concentrates on rural Hungary, they shall demonstrate how Hungarian film, films question the success of transition, placing focuses, the focus on the challenges of the new economic system and the resultant unemployment, financial hardship, misanthropy and vigilantism, which have invariably come to define regional living in post-communist Hungary. In order to better situate my analysis, allow me to briefly offer a little historical context. During Hungary's first free election, there was general consensus among opposing parties that privatization presented the most logical path for trans uh, transitional reform. Generally speaking, given the strong anti-communist sentiment that was widespread following transition, the electorate moved this viewpoint. Hungarians have long been drip-fed evidence that private market economics offered higher living standards and as a result, optimism was high for the prosperity, comfort, and consumer choice they associated with Western capitalism. Following the abolition of communist-inscribed laws restricting foreign trade, Western corporations swiftly launched franchises into Hungary's newly opened market. It must be noted that this formed part of an ongoing process that had begun during the later stages of Janos Gerard's Gulash communism. International advertising and public uh, relations companies acquired major state and Hungarian communication agencies. Advertising expenditure rose exponentially during the first uh, decade of post-communism, from 50 million in 1990 to over 1,800,000,000 million in 2000. Hungarian advertising placed emphasis on the authenticity of Western consumer goods, as is evident in Coca-Cola's slogan, Igozi, or the real one. Such claims to authenticity were attempts to legitimize Western consumer habits as both genuine and rightful in a country that had initially met advertising with suspicion, believing it to be, for, uh, be a form of government propaganda. New sites of consumption began construction in Budapest in the mid-90s, backed principally by American finance. The Duna Plaza, the nation's first American-style uh, shopping mall, opened its doors in 1996, establishing what Judith Bodden describes as a novelty in the local culture of shopping. The shopping mall also presented Hungarians with a new way of experiencing cinema. The multiplex cinema offered audience the late, audiences the latest in exhibition technologies in showcasing of the most recent Hollywood blockbusters. To ensure exhibition in Hungary, Hollywood distribution companies bought majority shares in Hungarian film distributors. 
United International Pictures emerged with Budapest Film to create UIP, Duna Nemzet Cozy Film, uh, creating distribution links for Paramount and Universal. Carol Co., the short-lived American independent production company, acquired stakes in Mar Film and Hungro Film, finding, founding Intercom Film, who have since established rights to distribute films made by 20th Century Fox, Columbia Pictures, Buena Vista International, and Warner Brothers. Western, particularly American media, for its ubiquitous present presence in uh, Hungarian public culture, was thus accorded great significance as a central source from which Hungarians, especially the youth, shaped their sense of self. As Heather Addison suggests, movies inspired wants that advertisers could exploit, and advertisements incited wants that movies could uh, vicariously satisfy, establishing a cycle in which these phenomena tended to reinforce each other in a symbiotic fashion. Through these examples, one is able to observe the extent to which neoliberalism has Americanized Hungarian culture. The presence of American brands, franchises, and other elements of popular culture have become symbols by which Hungary demonstrates Western integration, and by extension, the success of transition. However, Rudolf and Capitan critique this assumption in Glass Tiger, suggesting that Western integration has only led to superficial change. One of the main narrative strands sees regular patron Gavin convince Lolly into trading his UAZ for an American 1971 Chevrolet Impala, believing the vehicle to better represent Lolly's personality. The change from a Russian manufactured utility vehicle to a sleek, a sleek and stylish American sedan demonstrates the changing emphasis towards image and self perception that the capitalist environment promoted. However, towards the end of the film, when Gavin delivers the Impala uh, to the cafe, an articulated truck reverses into it, crushing the car before Lally can even get behind the wheel. And I'm just going to show you a little clip. The Impala can be seen as more than simply a vehicle. It is a commodified representation of Lolly's design persona, how he wishes to, perceived, to, to be perceived in a particular consumer-based post-communist setting. Sociologist Joseph E. Davis claims that within a consumer society, social identities remain, but as one is turned into a consumer, they are increasingly shaped by conditions, uh, by, and conditioned by patterns of consumption. We identify our real selves by the choices we make, from the images, fashions, and lifestyles available in the market, and these in turn become the vehicles by which we perceive others and they us. The Chevrolet, as advertised as the heartbeat of America during the 1980s, is the United States' best-selling vehicle manufacturer, becoming an icon of Americana. For Lolly, the Impala represents the American dream, social mobility, liberation, and status. It also confirms upon him a sense of belonging within a global capitalist environment. This destruction, however, denies Lolly the status, cementing the fact that the way of life he yearns for is ultimately unattainable. Similarly, the collapse of communism allowed Hungarians to envision new personal identities motivated by what they believed would be an, ine an, ine excuse me, an inevitable economic and social boom as a result of the a new market economy. The realities of post-socialist uh, post uh, transition were, of course, very different. While Hungarian cities have been saturated with consumer advertising, 
and shops stocked with the latest products, these items have continued to be elusive for those who simply cannot afford them. Counter to the social and economic upturn many had expected, Hungary witnessed a huge uh, rise in unemployment as a, rise of private, as a result of privatisation. During the early years of post-communism, many of the former state-run enterprises deemed uneconomical were closed. Unemployment subsequently led to a number of other social problems, such as the rise in crime, alcoholism, and an increase in mental health problems. Poverty also created a sense of exclusion, as consumerism increasingly became the means by which Hungarians shaped new cosmopolitan and indeed westernised identities. Uh, Gustav uh, Kostelani states, to be included, you must conform to the expectations generated by advertising agencies, suggesting that the freedoms American consumer culture had represented under communism have been bastardised by a neoliberal neo agenda. David Harvey suggests that the freedom of the market, proclaimed as the high point of human aspiration, turns out to be nothing more than a convenient means to spread corporate monopoly power and Coca-Cola everywhere without constraint. In the same way the Impala provides only with a platform of self-representation, consumerism has become an articulation of self-worth and individuality in a post-communist milieu. However, just as Lolly has ultimately denied the, the distinction that the vehicle represents, the hardships of post-communist transition deny the majority the means of self-expression and dignity that come from Western consumerism, thus highlighting the still-present division between post-communist Hungary and the West. Not only does consumerism mask the realities of post-communist life, it can be seen as a cloak that covers the enduring footprint of communism. This is no more evident than in Lolly's place of work, the Glass Tiger Cafe. The Glass Tiger is daubed in the stars and stripes of the American flag and sells American cuisines such as hot dogs, um, hamburgers, and Fanta Orange. Nevertheless, this affront to westernization cannot hide the fact that the cafe is best, a communist establishment dressed in the mirage of Americana. Andre P. P. Segledi, in his description of a typical co uh, communist fast food establishment, states that these uh, fast food stands are small scale, cobbled together from a bewildering array of materials. They tend to be sparsely furnished and chaotically decorated. If there is a permanent premises, it is often grubby with the use of one or two closely situated countertops on which uh, they may consume their loosely packaged food. Uh, so, uh, such a description invites comparison to the Glass Tiger. The cafe itself is a tow caravan with a filthy countertop and a couple of white plastic uh, dining tables with matching chairs. It is barely apparent that the caravan is actually a cafe, save for the countertop, which becomes obscured amongst the jumbled design of the exterior. The, glass tiger, the name Glass Tiger holds no relevance to the fast food industry, neither does the US Navy 625 test that does the caravan's frontage. Inside the, caravan is, uh, sorry, inside the cafe is equally chaotic. The cramped interior is cluttered with old beer cans and leftover food. Fixtures are heavily stained with grease and other food-related spillages. There is a television in one corner, and the walls are covered with posters of topless centerfolds and images of Hungarian boxer Ishvan Kovac. The cafe's signage is made from an assortment of makeshift neon lights. The cobbled put together nature becomes increasingly inadequate when compared to the clear and coherent nature of banners and logos utilised by global multinational companies. While the Golden Arches of the McDonald's logo is one of the most recognisable images in the world, the Glass Tigers logo is barely legible. In capitalist uh, profit-oriented business, consumer service has become increasingly standardised. As George Richter say, states, much of what is said in, in fast food restaurants by both employees and customers is ritualised, routinized, and even scripted. Customer service has become the lifeblood of any capitalist establishment and staff are expected to follow certain protocol in their interaction with customers, which encourages both speed and courtesy. With respect to customer service, Catherine Averdery distinguishes the different emphasis between capitalist and, com com excuse me, and communist enterprises. In our capitalist society, the problem is over sellers, and to outcompete them, you have to befriend the buyer. Thus our clerks and shop owners smile and give, and give customers friendly service because they want business. In socialism, the, the locus of competition was elsewhere. Your comp the competitor was of the buyers. Thus, in socialism, it was not the clerk who was friendly, but the procurer, the customer, who sought to integrate themselves with smiles, bribes, and favours. 
The film demonstrates on a number of occasions Lolly's communist approach to customer service. While friends and family are given preferential treatment, we see, for example, that uh, inside the Glass Tiger, Lolly has a tab system established for his regular patrons. Other customers are met with disdain. Lolly's attitude bears a resemblance to the communist retailer who, as anthropologist Mil Melissa L. Caldwell states, wielded considerable power, deciding not only whether to serve a particular customer, but also which items to sell and of what quantity. I'm going to show you an example of that now. So in way of summary, Glass Tiger suggests that the fetishized smokescreen of American consumer culture masks the reality of post-communist Hungary. Through Lolly's unfulfilled desire to own a Chevrolet and parlor, we see that the conditions of post-communism deny many Hungarians the lifestyle Western consumerism had promoted throughout the communist years, despite the omnipresence of westernized consumer artifacts. Also, through Lolly's working practices as proprietor of an American-themed fast food cafe, we are able to observe the lingering legacy of communism, thus suggesting that to judge the success of Hungary's transition to market economy, one must look beyond the veil of facile westernization.